Cool. All right, guys, I'm Chris. I'm here with Ryan Riziki, top cruiserweight contender and former world title, title challenger. Ryan, how you doing, man? Good, how are you? Not too bad. So we're here at TNT. Ryan, I see a lot of tape on those bags. Yeah. Are right, those all from you? Uh, I can't take all the credit, but pretty much. Yeah, like when I, when I first started coming here, I think uh, 2018 was when I started coming here. Oh, yeah. There was no tape on any of the bags. <laughs> so, <laughs> so what made you want to transition to come to Guelph to train at TNT? That's, that's a good, that's an interesting story. So it goes back to Nationals 2015, I'm going to say. I fought, uh, I went there as a super heavyweight. So I was actually like 190, 195, okay. but so I'm from Nova Scotia, but the, um, they already had a heavyweight and then it goes, it goes in amateurs, you know, it goes heavyweight and then super heavyweight. So as a pro, it would be like cruiserweight then heavyweight, but yeah. So, so I was like, I had no choice, but to go was a super heavyweight, but I was, I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have went as one anyways, got there. And, uh, the first draw I got. John Simon Keane, the biggest super heavyweight that was at the tournament. And um, so I fought fought him and I remember before the weigh-ins, I chugged four liters of water. We put ankle weight, I wore these baggy jogging pants and I strapped ankle weights on oh. to get over 200 pounds. I think he weighed like 250. Anyways, we fought and it was a good fight. It was close. He won I lost the decision, but like, man, I took a lot of big shots. The fight's on YouTube. like. And he couldn't hurt me like he could not wobble me and then um after the fight i remember i'm walking down the hallway back so the the i can't remember exactly i think the fights were in um they were somewhere in montreal i believe anyways i'm, I'm we're in the hotel the, the venue was inside the hotel at nationals at the tournament right yeah and i'm walking back to my room i was actually walking back to get my quart of vodka because i was done th for the tournament i was out because i i took a lot of shots so the um the national team was like, yeah, you're not, because usually you're out, then you could fight, like, you could fight again, even though you're, like, the other guys going on, you could, like, do another fight, but I couldn't, so I was like, oh, I might as well get drunk then, yeah. so, <laughs> so, so I was on the way back to my room to get my vodka, and so I'm heading down the hallway, heading towards the elevator, and, like, I just had a war with this guy, right, so I'm kind of, like, stumbling a little bit, and I'm heading down, and all of a sudden, like, this guy kind of, like, I kind of, like, stumble at and this guy like must have saw me coming and he's like hey man like what, what's going on here and he said great fight and he, he told me like you shouldn't you know you shouldn't be drinking and all this and he's like if some I, I, I can't remember exactly what he said but it was somewhere along the lines like if somebody just taught you one thing like he he, he and he he was very serious when he was and he just holding my hand like a firm handshake and you know if somebody taught you something you're going to go a long way and i never really heard anyone say that before because mm -hmm. i was just I was just a tough guy boxing for because kept me out of trouble, right? Yeah. So, anyways, I I had never forgot that, but I didn't know who the guy was. Yeah. And it ended up being Stevie, by the way. So <laughs> he had he had fighters at that nationals, and uh, we went. On. And then so, what was it? About a year went by. I kept going on my my amateur career, and then I had a fight in my hometown. I fought the main event at Center Two Hundred, and I fought a guy who from Guelph. And uh, they brought him. They brought him to Cape Breton, and I fought him. They, yeah, I said it was the main event. It was Stevie's fighter, and and I remember like when we we're you know everybody's getting ready to fight, we're doing the weigh-ins and all that. I was like, I remember this coach. Like, I remember this coach. So I, I never, like I said, never really thought nothing of it. I'm in the next thing you know, I'm in the ring. First round, I'm always going. And the amateurs, I was always going for the first round knockout. Like. I didn't care about winning no decisions. Same as a pro. Anyways, um, so I remember, I just remember very vividly not being able to do nothing with this guy. And I could hear the guy's corner because this was this was up in the concourse at Center 200. So it was very tight, like not much bigger than this gym. Mm -hmm. And it was packed. There was probably like, did you imagine a thousand people in this gym? Yeah. It so was, I mean, shoulder, it, shoulder. Was, it was more, people were on top of each other. Oh, man. It was tight. But I could hear his corner over everything, which was Stevie, yeah. yelling to the guy instructions. And I remember in my head, I'm like, he, he was just saying these things. And then the guy was doing exactly what he was saying, but I didn't know what he was doing. And there was nothing I could do about it. And I lost the fight. And I, I remember afterwards just thinking to myself, like, man, whoever that guy's coach was, like, he was so smart. Like, how, how'd he do that? Like, how'd he beat me yeah. like that, right? 
And I just, I always kept it in my head. And anyways, I found out who the guy was. It was, it was Stevie Bailey. So that's when I started paying attention, like, well, who is this coach over in, over in Ontario? And, and I never planned on leaving Cape Breton Island, never for no reason. Mm -hmm. Anyways, my, my career went on. And I ended up fighting that same guy again, uh, but he was with a different coach. Uh, and that was at the Olympic qualifiers. But Stevie was also there with a fighter, which was his, um, basically at that time, his star pupil at that time was Brock Stumpf. You might remember him from yeah. the amateurs. And so Brock was like a very similar style to myself, kind of a brawler, didn't do much, but Stevie had him beating all the guys that I couldn't beat in the amateurs. I was losing the guys, then Stevie and Brock would beat them. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, man, like, like I just, I knew it, it, things started to like push me towards, you gotta get, this guy's gotta be your coach, right? So then um, turn pro, had my first seven pro fights, I believe. Uh, I had help, I had different coaches back in Nova Scotia help me here and there. So I was very lucky that way. But I always, I knew I had to get here. Mm -hmm. So then um, I ended up getting a manager who was from home, Mike Power. He knew Stevie, he was, he was close with him. They were, they were not close, but they knew each other. So anyways, um, that's when it got linked up where he was like, you know, you want, I told him like, is there any way you could ever put me in contact with Stevie Bailey, maybe get him to coach me. Luckily that worked out and I came here like for my eighth pro fight. And you've been with them ever since? Ever since, yeah. And I and I knew once I once I had the opportunity to come here, like I was just all ears listening and you can look at our progression from my eighth pro fight up until now. It's just like unbelievable, right? The yeah. the we had right away we had this like um like this bond or click? Yeah, like it was almost more psychological than anything. But like you guys understand each other real well. Yeah, like very similar ways of thinking. Cause yeah. He comes from a place in Ireland, which is it's very similar to my hometown in Cape Breton. Very, mm -hmm. very similar way of thinking. So, you know, that had a lot to do with it. Yeah. So February 11th, you're back at the Hamilton Connection Center. You're headlining against Arthur Gorlov. Gorlov. Gorlov, yeah. sorry Gorlob, if I butchered yeah. that. Yeah. You know, 10 and 2, respectable record. You fought in glory kickboxing. Uh, tell me about this fight. Yeah, so that's that's pretty much what I know of him. As he was a former kickboxing world champ. He said 10 and 2, 8 knockout wins mm -hmm. out of 10. So he can Bad punch. Man. So I got to um, be very, very, you know, have respect for his power. And anybody who was a world champ in any, any combat sports is, they're a winner. Yeah. You know, so winning mentality where he comes from, tough place, and you know, just that's it. But to be honest with you, this stage in the career, it's not even about the opponents. It's about just being better. Every every fight, yeah. progressing, progressing, progressing. The, the opponents are just gonna come, they're yeah. gonna go, they're gonna come, they're gonna go. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. So I follow you on Instagram, you post some awesome stuff. It seems like 2023, you want to make a statement. Oh, yeah. You want your name to be a household name in the boxing scene, as I think it should by the way you fight. Tell me how you're going to do that this year, by just continuously to knocking, pe knocking people out. I know you've never fought outside Canada. Is that something you want to like to do? Oh, 100%. I've been, I've been waiting patiently for the year to like break out into the scene. And it's, it's not so much that I want to be a household name, to be honest with you. It's that I want... Like when I look at the top guys, I want to fight them all, every mm -hmm. one of them. And like, you know, some people might think it's a little crazy, but I want to fight all the heavyweights too. Like I want to fight the cruiser rates. I want to fight the bridger rates. Yeah. I want to fight the heavyweights. I want to like, I want to do something that hasn't been done before. Yeah. Yeah. And, and just, just for the history of boxing, like to, to do something like what Jack Dempsey did against Jess Willard, for me, that's, that's kind of like what I want my legacy to be. Right on, and I know something you've mentioned before is you'd like the opportunity maybe to possibly fight in a Jake Paul undercard. Uh, tell me about that. Yeah, so yeah, that's a that's a very high possibility that this might happen this year. Really, I can't give out too much information, but there is something. So how does that? I saw Dan Otter. He saw Jake Paul at like some boxing convention in Florida. Yeah, maybe something went down there. I don't know. Yeah. But how does that work between Three Lions and MVP Promotions? Well, pretty much, Three Lions is. They want the exposure, yeah. just like I do. And 
the uh, well MVP promotions. I can't speak for them, mm -hmm. but I do know people on Jake's team that I speak to. BJ Flores. Yeah, and he he know like he seen me fight. Yeah, and he he knows who I am. We talk back and forth, and like I don't know if he's spoken to Jake yet about it, but I know he would love to have me on one of the undercards just to kind of like just to have a top cruiserweight would be great for his card for sure you know what i mean and then obviously for myself three lines for stevie for for yeah. all of the team like it would be great for the exposure it's a big moment for almost everyone part of your circle right even for canada just yeah, to have exactly. a, just to have a canadian fighter on one of those big cards would be huge get that you know the not the real boxing fan what do you want to call them the, the card? youtube box yeah guys. like they're they're important too yeah. like you need those guys too nowadays well, isn't it going to be crazy that one day do you think a world champion it's gonna be like, I started boxing because of Jake Paul, KSI. Like, do you think that might happen one day? Or is that kind of an iffy statement, do you think? Nah, nah, there's, there's, I wanna, like, I'm gonna give my respects to Jake because, like, this guy's fighting fighters. Yeah, yeah. they're past, they're over the hill, they're not. MMA fighters. You know, MMA, they're MMA, but, like, again, winning, men, winning mentality is a winning mentality. Yeah. Don't matter what combat sport it is, and he's fighting these guys versus the other ones are like what are they they're like celebrities fighting celebrities yeah. dancers fighting youtubers youtubers fighting basketball players like yeah. <laughs> you know that's kind of but but jake actually seems to be stepping up he's like done. like mo like an actual real professional i, I does. think he's a business genius what he's doing is he's just slowly leveling up 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 and up yeah until yeah. but do you honestly think he's gonna fight a guy like you though no 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 and, and because as soon as he loses, you know, the Jake Paul show is over, right? People want to keep watching him because they want to see him lose. That's yeah. how I believe. But we got to, like, like I said, he, he um, I do give him respect now. The beginning, I didn't because obviously it's like, it's annoying as a pro fighter to, after you go through so many years of hard work and then these guys just kind of, boom, they just kind of come out of nowhere and they're like taking the show. Yeah. So our egos are like, hey, what the? You know, yeah. you see all the boxers getting offended and stuff, but then it's like you got to sit back and be like, you know what, like let him do his thing. Let him do his thing because it only helps us. It's grown the sport, I personally believe. Yeah, and and everybody that's in boxing is good for boxing. Yeah, exactly. it doesn't matter what they're doing. Now, what are your thoughts on that whole PFL deal? PFL? Uh, do you see Jake Paul sign with PFL, Professional Fighters League, no. an MMA organization? Oh, okay. Yeah. So apparently, he's claiming he's going to fight in MMA, but I don't know. It's just confusing me because I'm like, are you still boxing? Like, are you trying? To, I heard there's a rumor he's trying to do a boxing fight with Nate Diaz, then an MMA fight. Uh, what like, what do you think of that? Let's. Well, you you can't believe it till you see it. Yeah. So you it's just I mean? it's just all chitter chatter for now. You believe? Yeah, it? yeah. So like, there you, you, there's so much um, there's so much bullshit. Yeah. Well, speaking of, <laughs> speaking of bullshit and chitter chatter, yeah. Hasim Rahman Jr. He uh, mentioned your name on a podcast. They're talking about your fight against Revis. Yeah. He said, I think he said he'd fight you. Like. Uh, you said you're tired of guys spitting your name and not down the fight. Like, what was your thought when you saw that clip? I know you kind of made it. I, I messaged him personally right away. What did you, did you respond? Oh, yeah. We had a whole conversation. Anything you could mention or is it just private? He just said he won't fight me. Because he yeah. he's going through the YouTube route. He signed with Happy Punch. And he's like saying in that podcast, I want to be a world champion. Yeah. Well, if you're fighting Greg Hardy when he's 100 pounds heavier than you and losing, you're not going to become a world champion, you know? I think it seems like he's trying to just get the bag while he can. Yeah. No, I, I straight up, I said to him, listen, like, he said you'd fight me, so let's fight. And, uh, you know, yeah, at first he was kind of like arguing with me back and forth. And I'm just like, 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 I'm not here trying to disrespect you. It's just like you said you would fight. So why don't we fight? Mm -hmm. I, well, I would like to fight you. You know just straight up and obviously i could use the exposure so he'd be a great name to freaking okay. you to use to get some exposure and he he said straight up you know we're on different levels you just fought for a world title i just i'm coming off i think he said he's coming off some losses yeah. which i didn't even back know to back losses he lost to yeah. uh okay tommy morrison's son or something don't correct me if i'm wrong and then uh greg hardy like i just mentioned oh see i don't i didn't know like i i told he, him he i was fought on one of those uh I saw you, like, actually, I wanted to mention this too. Uh, one of those Misfits boxing cards. I saw you, you unfollowed uh, ESPN ringside and DAZN boxing. You didn't want to see any of that. I just shit. unfollowed today. I unfollowed pretty much all, all of them. And I'm, it's not that I'm like, a, I'm not hating on these guys. It's just, I, I, it's kind of, it pisses me off that like, these are the outlets, you know, for the real fighters. Yeah. And like I said before, as far as Jake Paul goes, he's fighting fighters. 
Yeah. At this stage, in the beginning he wasn't, but now he's Anderson Silva. Come on. Yeah. Like for a for a for a three or four fight pro novice to, with no amateur fights. One, I don't care if you're. We had one amateur yeah, fight. Yeah, you oh, fought a YouTuber, but which so don't even count. Yeah. So like I I could tell you pros around here in Canada who don't take step ups like that. They yeah. fight guys with records like ten and thirty. Bunch of journeymen. Yeah, like you know what I mean. So yeah. he's taken the real. Right. Whereas the other guys, they're just fighting each other. Yeah, I don't support it. So any of the the major TV networks that are, they're choosing to support that over rather putting on a fight like let's say, I don't know Wilder versus Ruiz yeah. or like let's let's you know what I mean like these, the even like just anybody any of the real fighters they rather put all their time effort money and promotion into into promoting these guys like it's like, you know what about the real fighters what about our what about the real sport, you know? That, so I'm just unfollowing them all. And finally, last part of um, in our shit talking fit, uh, conversation here, Peralta. Yeah. He's talking a lot of trash. You stated, you're like, I will go to Argentina and fight you. Are you like, kind of like moving on a bit? Like maybe if you won, win the WBC Cruiserweight title, that'd be mm. a cool defense because you guys have history, right? Yeah, and it, it, would, it would have to be in his backyard. Yeah. I would 100%, I would, sign a contract right now and i would fly to argentina and fight him this weekend yeah without a question do you just you very dislike this guy very much not at first at first i was i was actually like you know there's a guy who you know i i know like i understand because like, he comes from a, probably a tough place yeah he, you know he fought his way to get it into a big fight which was the fight against me did everything he could possibly do and he didn't win and then he goes home you know that's like oh shit, you know sucks for you like whatever but at the same time, man, like, if I, if, the, if the tables were turned and I was the one who lost the fight mm -hmm. in his hometown, just shut up and go on with your career. Back like, to the gym. You know, back to the gym, whatever. It's not my fault that the judges scored it the way they did. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. that it is what it is. So I think right now with him, he's just, it's tough for him because who's going to want to fight him? Yeah. And, like, which TV network is going to want to literally put money out to watch this guy run around the ring and hug people yeah he, he's not a fan friendly he's not tv friendly and he not knows exciting. it so now the only real big fight he's going to get the only payday probably a rematch with me mm -hmm. because he he knows that i'm easy like i'm easy to piss off yeah right he thinks he can <laughs> get you going yeah and then get himself into a fight because i'm i'm gonna guess right now he's having a a lot of difficulties getting a big fight for sure after just like kind of some huggle snuggles performances who's gonna who's gonna want to watch him yeah like, you know? <laughs> i i honestly like like i said i would fight him again it have to be in his hometown his judges his ref that way there'd be no excuses yeah. you know and, and i'm not saying i would win i'm just saying like That's i don't you want i don't want to go down that road again where it's like the controversy thing like nah yeah nah. like you want to do it in his way yeah you'll give him the opportunity to do it his way that's it that's awesome. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I want to backtrack a little bit. Who are your fighting inspirations and who currently do you like to watch the most? Jack Dempsey. Jack Dempsey. Always been, always will be. Um, so when I was like, I think, I think I had my first, I know I had my first amateur fight when I was 15, but the first time I went to box and I was 14 and I, it was a court order. My, my actual, my probation, like I was on probation for getting into a bunch of street fights. That's another whole story well, topic, there, but I've like, been there too. I, yeah, but it continues there. So, so the the judge was just sick of seeing me, right? And I'm like, I'm in the youth court constantly. Anyways, my dad brings me in. I was up on charges, assault, causing bodily harm, and uh, this judge was just like, Ryan, he's like, you need to join some kind of contact sport. Take this energy go do something because you're going to hurt somebody like you're getting bigger you're getting stronger you know at first i'm getting going into court because i assaulted some kid now i'm in court because there's the ambulance bills and there's hospital bills yeah. and someone's got a broken jaw and skull and everything else so it's like it's getting serious at that age right yeah so they're like you got to join boxing or something so i wanted to join hockey because every all my buddies played hockey yeah so i'm like yeah well my dad's like i'll join hockey so it was going to be one of my my conditions, my probation order, you know, they give you your list of conditions. You got to do your community service. You got to be in at seven o'clock, all that stuff. One of mine where you got to, I was supposed to participate in a sport. So my dad was like, well, how about boxing? You want to give boxing a try? And I'm like, boxing? 
like I didn't even know what boxing really was. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was like, I guess so. He's like, yeah, I know the local boxing coach. So first thing I do, I go home, I get on the internet and I start Googling boxing and I'm going through these videos and it might, it might've been YouTube, but I can't really remember. I'm gonna guess it was YouTube. Yeah. And um, I'm going through these videos and the first thing I noticed that really just like it caught my eye was a black and white video and I clicked it. It ended up being Jack Dempsey versus Jess Willard. That was uh, July 4th, 1919. That was when Dempsey won the world title. And that's the first boxing I've ever seen in a video. And like, I'm watching this, right? And Dempsey knocks him down seven times in the first round. And he's like, he's standing over him and like Willard's trying to get up and he's hammering him. And that's before the neutral corner rule. Mm -hmm. And I'm watching this and I'm just like, whoa. Like, I, I'll never forget the feeling I was like, like that was it. Yeah. I went. I was. I went completely obsessed with boxing. You were hooked ever since. Oh, like, like, yeah, undescribable. But, like, it was Jack Dempsey though. Yeah. He had the he had the hair cut, shaved bald up the sides of his head, and he was just like, you could tell he all he wanted to do was just murder the guy. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? If there was no ref there, he would he would have murdered the guy. Mm -hmm. So and then that my style, like, if you watch my career, like, my style just ended up. I kind of emulate him. Mm -hmm. You know. That's awesome. Now I want to talk about your world title fight. Uh, well, first off, is is Rebus retired? Is that confirmed? Uh, it's, I don't think it's like publicly confirmed, but it's I saw it's it on confirmed. Twitter. It's confirmed. It's, yeah, yeah, he has a yeah. detached retina. Yeah, I can't. So that's too bad. What a legend! First off, best of luck in your retirement, Rebus. Yeah, he is a legend. One of my favorite fighters of this generation. For sure. Yeah. So talk to me about what is going on in your life when you get a world title shot inaugural WBC Bridgeweight, a weight class that no one's ever fought at. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, what's going on in your life? Because what I recall from seeing, doing my research, you are, were already in camp for that uh, Three Lions event that got canceled because of COVID, right? Yeah. And you were, were already in shape. Yeah. And you were ready, pretty much you got the call from Dan Otter and you just, because uh, you believe that Revis's people thought you were going to be an easy one. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, so I was, uh, I was back home. I think that was... So that was during hunting season. I was getting ready for hunting season. I was like, the only thing I cared about, so like from Cape, if you're from Cape Breton and you're a hunter, like and hunting season rolls around, as soon as those leaves start to change color, yeah, it's just like tunnel vision. All you care about, where's the deer? Where's the moose? Where's the bear? You got to fill the freezers. That's it. I don't even really think, that's the only time of the year I don't really think much about boxing. And it's an issue Like you could ask my promoters. They're like, we could, every time hunting season comes in, they're like, oh, we're going to lose him. <laughs> He's gone for two months. Forget <laughs> about him, man. So anyways, it's hunting season. So like, I don't train during hunting season. What I do is I'm hiking. I'm literally dragging like two, 300 pound animals. Like some Rocky Four type training? No, yeah. Like the, I got to get these bears on the back of the truck and hauling moose quarters and shit. Like it's, it's a lot of hard work building tree stands, things like that. So anyways, I'm in full blown hunting mode. And Dan calls me and he's like, Ryan, you sitting down? I'm like, yeah, I was actually in my truck. I'm like, yeah, I'm sitting down. He's like, I got a big opportunity for you. And I'm like, oh, what is it? World title shot. And I'm like, okay, I guess so. And he's like, it's Oscar Rivas. And I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> like, wait a second, isn't he heavyweight? He's like, yeah, it's for Bridgerweight. I'm like, what? What the heck is Bridgerweight? Right? I didn't even know. <laughs> yeah. like, what's going on i'm like okay well yeah i'll fight oscar like i because i inspired him when i was like 17. i, really? I inspired him man. yeah he's from he's based in montreal right yeah he was at uh, john pascal's gym when when i inspired him um my old amateur coach took me there and like yes yeah, so, but when we inspired when i was 17 like he was a nice guy like mm -hmm. he took it easy on me yeah he, he worked with me right because I, yeah. I was like the madman trying to take his head off kind of like i was like trying to prove something at that age but Revis really took it. He, every time I got worked up, he hit me with a jab in the stomach, and I'd just be like, Ugh, like yeah. <laughs> back and settle me down, right? So, um, anyways, I said, yeah, right away, and then went to camp. The fight was three weeks, so I had, by the time I got to camp, including rest days, and then the rest days before the fight, I think I had just about two weeks of training for that fight. Really? Yeah. yeah. And 14 days. What a war. Fight of the year contender. What do you think would have, do you think if there was a crowd, it would have made a difference? Mm, no, no, no. We could have fought literally right here. It was just pure carnage regardless. Yeah. Like, yeah, the, that fight, um, like Oscar, I, I fought, like I said, I actually watched the reason that I had uh, subscribed to the zone in the first place was to watch him versus Dillian White. Yeah. That's the only reason that I subscribed to the zone because I got, I was a fan of Oscar. He was still am. 
And um, yeah, I watched that fight and like, I knew his story. I knew everything about him pretty much. Never thought I'd end up fighting him. Yeah. But I knew he saw how hungry he was and how he never got that opportunity. Like nobody was gonna fight him. He just wasn't a big draw. Too dangerous, punches too hard, too Risky hard to fight. hurt. Like for a guy like Wilder or Tyson Fury, like why would they bother with that guy? Yeah. Leave him where he's at, you know what I mean? Let him do his thing. Let him do his cause like he's just too dangerous. Mm -hmm. You know? So yeah, I I thought I think they took the fight with me, they thought it was gonna be an easy night. Now, I I feel like you're kind of solely focused on cruiserweight right now, but is Bridgeweight something you think about again? Yeah, I've I've already been like messaging um Alan Babbage. Yeah, so he's supposed to fight for the world title now, right? I threw him a, a little message there the other day, just kind of, because I, I didn't really know about the Revis retiring thing. Yeah, and it's still up in the air, like we were talking about. Previously, yeah, right. Like it kind of hit a nerve because I was like, I saw that they were just going to hand Alan Babbage the belt, and me and him were we we've been chatting a little bit here and there anyway, but when I saw they were going to give him the belt, I was just like, wait a second, if anybody should be getting the first crack at that belt, I felt like. Like it was me, because mm -hmm. like me and Revis were the only two guys to ever fight for it. He's, Never got defended since your fight, right? No, like he he's done. Like yeah. it was the beginning of one man's career and the end of another's yeah, that literally. fight, you know. And um, so I I felt like I might not be the champion. Revis is the champion or yeah. was the champion. I would never take credit, but I was the closest thing to it. And I felt like, what the hell, you know what yeah. I mean? Like if yeah. they're if they're gonna give anyone the shot, it should be me fighting Alan Babbage yeah. or something. But then it's like, uh, we also made the decision to take the cruiserweight ranking over the bridge rate mm -hmm. when the when the WBC offered it. So I, had, I got pissed off at first and I was like, message I'm like, hey, when they wrap that belt around your waist, don't forget. That's that, that like I retired the guy that they took that belt from, you know what I mean? Yeah. And like, I mean, I could try to be humble about it, but it, it is what it is. Facts are facts, it's right? Facts are facts. No, you, you know, not, so you're not wrong. So, speaking of cruiserweight, uh, do you think you're one or two fights away from that? I also heard a rumor you were lined up for the WC cruiserweight title. Yep. Um, that's and but doesn't Canelo also have like some kind of clause where he can fight for it? Like it's kind of a bit messy right now. It is a bit messy right now. I don't know what's going on. Like probably four, maybe yeah, but four months ago, it was after the Peralta fight. I got a call to fight Macabre. Yeah. In the Congo, and I signed the contract. I was literally ready to go. Like. I was packing my bags in his backyard you were going to go across the country or oh the yeah world, sorry. it was a done deal and then literally as we're like lining everything up about to start booking flights and like everything was done I was going to look for a sponsor mm -hmm. that's when I got another call and it was like no nope, there's something going on over there and they couldn't like I don't want to say too much but they couldn't guarantee our safety because of the the, the the country I guess yeah, there's, there's some, something going on in the yeah. country and that's all I really heard and then that was that and they they told us that you know we might give you the shot in a couple months time or something it's like okay so we were we weren't going to wait around that's why we took the fight last month in the meantime and then yeah crickets after that yeah yeah when did you realize you had power 15 ko's 16 fights you said you talked about street fighting earlier is that was it back then yeah i was 13 when i realized i had it like i hit a guy the first punch i've ever thrown in a street fight that's when i knew like I had no clue that I could hit that hard. I shouldn't say the first punch I threw in the street fight because the first one I threw, I, I broke a guy's nose, which is not, that's not a big deal. But it was like the first serious fight, maybe 14, 13, 14, 15, three on that age. I got jumped by like a group of men. They were probably ages 20 to 25, probably about 15 to 20 of them. They tried to jump me and two of my buddies, but two of my buddies took off running. So I was left by myself. And these guys had like baseball bats, they had steel toe boots, they had everything, right? So it was like, it was like literally kill or be killed. Yeah. And I just started throwing bombs. And next thing you know, there's just like, just these guys were laid out everywhere. One guy's like convulsing on the ground. One guy's like freaking teeth are everywhere. Like, yes. and, and, and I ended up like beating these, like probably like at least four, maybe five of them bad, like out cold sleeping and, and like really bad. Like night night. Like like hospitalized for like a while. And but then I I took a beat that this is what I found out all in one night. I found out what I could do to somebody and I also found out what I could take. Mm -hmm. Because after I did that, the rest of the these dudes were like 
kill this motherfucker, right? And at me, at like that age, I had this long hair down to here. So, and I was like, I look, I don't know what I look like. Right? I you had like the old Justin Bieber hair? Oh right? yeah, the yeah. wings used to blow dry it yeah. up and everything, right? A little hair flip too? I had the earrings <laughs> and everything. So I didn't look and I was a hundred and, I think I was like, so I never grew. I grew, like I sprouted and I stopped. So I was 6'2", 135. Damn. I was literally like that. But like just my hands were the same size. Yeah. So I had these like cinder blocks attached to noodles. <laughs> and I just throw them and when they hit, man. So so anyways, after I did my part, that's I wasn't running nowhere. It was just in me just to keep fighting. And then they tried to kill me. And they were like, they got me down on the ground. And I just remember like, my head being on the concrete and seeing like feet coming down boom and like my head was like cracking off the concrete and they were literally like trying to like crush my like skull stomp you but like i was nothing was happening like i just remember like looking up at them and just leaning like is that all you <laughs> and, and like they got to the point where they they actually stopped like it was like probably went on for like 10 15 minutes like i broke they broke all my ribs cheekbones was broke the, like I got hit in the back with brass knuckles. Oh like it was, goodness. it was crazy. Like my I was like blood head to toe. You wouldn't even recognize me after. And I just remember I had these old boots on, and I got up and like they they were like they all kind of backed off when I got up and I just went up and I was like put my boots back on. I was like, anybody see my buddies? And I started walking up the street oh. and these guys were like in shock that I, and then like it didn't. I, I kind of like passed out as I was going up the road. Ended up waking up like. Come, not waking up, but I, I came, kind of came back around when I was in the hospital. And like, that's when like my buddy and the other guy was my cousin and they were like, Ryan, I don't think you could be killed. <laughs> because they, <laughs> apparently they ran away because there's so many people jumping me that they wanted to like, they had to get out of there. They thought they, like, they literally killed you? Yeah, they, and then like next thing you know, I was just like walking back up the street and they were like throwing off, right? Stunned. Yeah, like they were like, like, it was just crazy. That's, that's insane. Yeah. Yeah. I want to talk about tattoos. Like, did you have any like inspirations for tattoos? You've got some awesome artwork. Um, Thank you. <laughs> and uh, just want to ask, like, what was your first tattoo, and what's the most painful one? First tattoo, I was eleven years old. <laughs> oh. <laughs> My uncle did it. It was a tiny little R. You can't see it. It's underneath. Covered up. Yeah, it's underneath the hood of this Reaper. But it was a little R. He did it with like I think it was. I don't know. I don't remember if it was like a homemade tattoo gun. He was so he was in jail and he. He had lots of tattoos. My uncle was like a street fight legend yeah. from Cape Breton. And he's covered in tattoos. So, and he's got like big scar on his face and everything. And when I was growing up, like a little guy saw him, like I was just like, whoa, like thought he was like, you know what I mean? Like yeah. a hero. Like badass. So, so I wanted tattoos too. And then I get one and like, I got like an extreme personality. So no, it wasn't just one. And then, and then every time something would like happen in life or, or like, I had some kind of crazy thoughts. I'd want to get a tattoo to like represent it. You know yeah. what I mean? So like all my tattoos, they actually all have meaning. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, you're probably wondering you're like, Chris, why do you have an iPad? I thought it'd be kind of fun. We're going to go and look over at some fighters tattoos yeah. and we'll get your reaction. So okay, yeah. I think it'd be uh, kind of funny. So I'm going to start off with Ryan Garcia. Uh, after his like whole like kind of break with his depression, he, he kind copied, of he copied Justin yeah, Bieber. He did. He kind of has Justin Bieber tattoos. He kind of went off. You know what I mean? Like he yeah. had. I think the Luke Campbell fight. He got this warrior one. So yeah. everyone, I remember everyone's making fun of him, like cute tat buddy and yeah. stuff like that. And then yeah, he he has like two doves, one lion with the crown, another lion. I don't know if you ever seen his back piece. It's like three crowns and like a dagger. Hmm. Well, but, uh, what I think is just like very. Um, as soon as you go on Google and you type in tattoos for men, like basic. these are the first things that are going to pop yeah. up. Yeah, well, you okay, know? Let's, let's, <laughs> let's be real. The most basic guy tattoos are a lion, yeah. like a compass, yeah. and maybe a rose. That's 100%. Of, yeah. yeah, a lion. That's Lion's that's, like the most, and the lion with the crown is even more basic, right? Yeah, I refuse to get a lion tattoo. Yeah. <laughs> the same here. Just for that reason. All right. But yeah. <laughs> I, the first thing I thought was he copied Justin Bieber. It, yeah, it looks exactly like it does. the cross Bieber, and stuff. Bieber has well, like the bear there. Or something. I don't know. He's yeah. a huge chess piece. But Maybe he's a fan, though. Yeah, who knows? They yeah. kinda, they're both pretty boys, right? Yeah, he might be a fan. All right. Next up, I got Javante Davis. He's really inked up over the years. I like his tattoos, actually. I've, I've just started following him. See, like, yeah. That's cool. He's got the see, la, see no evil. Yeah. Hear no evil, speak no evil. The monkeys there, respect. Mm -hmm. He's got a nice back piece as well, Baltimore on his back. 
Yeah, his tattoos all they look like they all have some pretty good meaning. Mm -hmm. 100%. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Next up, I got ferocious George Campos. There's a lot uh, of yeah. a lot of Greek uh, background with his tattoos, I believe. Spartan stuff, all family history. Yeah. Make, like again, that that's see that makes more sense. Yeah. Same with him. So him and compared to Ryan Garcia, these two guys got like real tats for you sure. Think, like their tats have more meaning, and like Ryan Garcia kind of like Googled what looks good. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Lastly, I got your teammate here, Josh the Boss Wagner. Yeah. He's got uh keep me where the light is. He's got like a Spartan there. Again, he's got the, like little like tiny tats. This is like all real stuff. You yeah. can tell. And he, I don't, I can't see in the picture, but I know he's got a little um, yeah on the side of his neck. Actually, I got the same tattoo right there. It's like almost like a gateway. Mm -hmm. It's like a gateway it's with the stairs. You're going into like a dark room. I know, I know what that means, and I know he has it too. Like mm -hmm. it's a that's real stuff. Yeah, Spartan. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, Josh's beauty like his artwork Strain. as well. He looks shredded in this photo, by the way. But yeah, that means you read here. Yeah, very, very. Beard. That's deep. Like I it can is. see it. He has deep tattoos. Yeah, he's. Yeah. I've known Josh. He's from around my hometown. He's been through it, and yeah. I, to see where he's at right now is incredible. Hundred percent. Like I don't know his story personally. Like I meet him. I just met him here training. Mm -hmm. Probably, few, well, a few few months now. We've trained. We def, we trained together quite a bit here, and uh, yeah, he, you can tell he's he's been through. Yeah. He's been through some stuff, I think. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Now, lastly, this has been an awesome interview, Ryan. Um, just want to hit you with a couple rapid fire questions. Tank Garcia or Ryan Garcia? Or, I mean, sorry, Tank Davis or Ryan Garcia, my fault. Tank. Tank? Knockout on the back foot with an overhand left. How many rounds? Probably six. Six. Yeah. Caleb Plant or Benavides? Benavides. Yeah. How do you see that fight ending? Decision? Mm, TKO. Benavides late, I think, body shots, and then probably. Stop him to the head. Not not a KO, but TKO. But I say Plant will put up a hell of a fight. Yeah. Yeah. Does Errol Spence and T Bud Crawford happen in twenty twenty three? I don't know, but if it if it does, I got Crawford. Nice. I think Crawford. Yeah. If Jake Paul and Tommy Fury were to fight, who do you have? Jake Paul. Finish. Mm, yeah, right hand. Nice, nice. I I just think I think Tommy Fury, he talked himself up a little too much and like. It's like you have to beat the YouTuber, yeah. And that's so much. That's so much like pressure on him. I could see him like, and he's got to live up to his name. Like that's too much. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's got a deep last name. Yeah. So. Yeah. I and just don't think he's cut from that same. Oh, uh, he's he's cut from the reality TV cloth. <laughs> yeah. Not not the not the Fury cloth. Without a doubt. And lastly, by twenty twenty three, will Ryan Rizicki have that green WBC belt strapped around his waist? If I get the chance to fight for it, I will. It's just a matter of, will they give me the shot? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Other yeah. than that, how many fights are you expecting this year, do you think? I'd like to have, personally, I'd like to fight six times a year. Wow. But I know the business, that's tough. Yeah. So, realistically, I'd say four. Four? Yeah. That'd be awesome. Yeah. And lastly, what would you like to say to all the Ryan, Bruiser, Riziki fans out there? Keep keep watching, keep supporting, and you know, obviously thank you, thank you for supporting and stuff. Hey, and if you don't, you know, you do, you do. <laughs> you don't, just keep watching. <laughs> yeah, it'll always be exciting whether I get knocked out or I knock them out. All right, on. Well, Ryan, I appreciate your time. Yeah, it was a great, awesome conversation, and yeah. hopefully I can interview maybe prior to the next fight. Yeah, for sure, man. Awesome, Sounds appreciate good. it. Thank yeah. you, man.